you know in one of my books shiv uh, shivrai's wife putala rani asks him what is what freedom means to you so he tells her in simple words freedom means to me that i must do what i want to do and i must refuse what i do not want to do which was not the case in his growing up years which was not the case with most of the maratha clan he knew so he wanted to attack the mores first he wrote lot of letters to mores please join me so mores said nothing doing who are you mores were also very arrogant they were collecting coming to shivraj territory and his jagir and collecting taxes and you know they were torturing farmers so shivraj said stop all this and join me against my fight against adil chai then one lobby was formed anti bhosle lobby because here shivra they were jealous of shahji raje and shivra was you know asking them to do things which were unheard of welcome to part 2 of our special trilogy on chatrapati shivaji maharaj the last one was about the context the prequel to shivra's birth this one will focus on his early years his early ascent to power but moreover it will also focus on his philosophy how did this great story begin how did the beginnings of the maratha empire actually begin what were the foundation stones there's a lot of history lessons in this one there's a lot of philosophical lessons in this one and when we're talking about a great king like shivrai there's a lot of psychology involved as well episodes like this are the reason i love history i'm going to let you all head straight into the episode remember to follow us on spotify every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world because trs is a spotify exclusive part 2 of our shivrai special with medha bhaskar and ma'am is here enjoy this is going to be one of the most epic trs episodes mera baskaran returns again for part 2 of our indian history special on chatrapati shivaji maharaj part 1 was all about the mughals and the setting before shivrai's birth at the start of that episode ma'am you kind of drew out a picture of india at the time and how it wasn't entirely under mughal rule it was primarily under mughal rule but specifically let's talk about the deccan plateau and more specifically maharashtra what was happening yeah very good question uh when shivrai was born mm. at that time nizam shahi which reigned in supreme in maharashtra at that time the mughals tried to capture it the nizam shahi because see geopolitically the biggest border with mughals southern border was the nizam shahi's northern border mm. so the first thing the, when you descend from the north you come to daulatabad which is in maharashtra near aurangabad and aurangabad was the capit mughal deccan capital of the mughal mm. it was named after aurangzeb mm. it was first known as Kir- kirki 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 is what in urdu kirki in marathi khidki means oh. the window hmm. the window to the deccan it used to be known as then when aurangzeb came as the mughal subedar he was stationed at aurangabad and he named that as aurangabad okay so you they descended down they wanted to come to uh, they wanted to capture more and more of the deccan and the first st- first station was nizam shahi who were the nizam shahis ethnically like where were they from originally there is a story they say a brahmin hindu was converted and then he became the first nizam okay so they were the deccanis the original deccanis wasn't they were indian ethnic they were indian ethnic okay. yeah so um so they the first station for the mughal attack was nizam shahi i will tell you history in brief from akbar's time they were trying from akbar and then uh, jahangir and then um, shah jahan all tried to capture the deccan 
they wanted those provinces those vassals to become the provinces of the mughal why power why means no, they was there something special about maharashtra as a land see that's very good question okay is excellent question i will tell you what was the uh, strategy of the mughal empire how they expand their army how do they expand their army by adding more and more mansabdars ha huh? they already had 8000 mansabdars 20% of the land of 22 mughal provinces were under mansabdars now if i want to add on more mansabdars what do i need to give them some perks land hmm. i need to give them land so they can rule and they can uh, collect i mean there is there were military mansabdars and then there were civil mansabdars even if you are a doctor in the mughal darbar you are a mansabdar but you will not get the uh, cavalry force you will get you will not get the land you will get salary but the war mansabdars they were given land and the land was over from 22 provinces 80% of the land was distributed am- among 8000 mansabdars so if you want to expand the army you uh, you need to add more mansabdars and you need to give them land mm. where would they get the land they will go to afghanistan that side or they will come to the deccan mm. because north east that arakan and those were very they were all watery marshy regions mm. there was nothing you could grow there there was probably uh, more primitive people more primitive people they couldn't deal with so what what were mughal aiming at they either could have taken now they tried they wanted rajasthan they were independent marwar and mewar kingdoms they wanted they were independent but all the kings of those were working in the mughal army but they were allowed to return their retain their kingdoms not mm-hmm. all of them but well, some of them because maybe even indirectly they were also mansabdars but in other, in the case of other mansabdars you you are a transferable today you are there this is very important today you are given a province of punjab some villages and towns tomorrow you if you lose the favor of uh, the emperor he may transfer you to the far east i mean north eastern borders or uh, north western borders which mm. are not very good so other mansabdars in in the uh, em, uh, empire of the mughals the mansabdars were transferable entity yeah and you could not the the mansabdars children could not inherit the same title as the mansabdar mm. okay as soon as the mansabdar died all his perks were taken away so what happened to the families we don't know families okay. were gone if one of the sons were able then the emperor it was on emperor's whims and fancies i would not say even merit whims and fancies mm. um you know i often think of telephones because i'm an electronics and telecommunication engineer okay. and when you study telecommunication you realize how much it's changed human existence Sorry. and then you think of these massive empires that existed in history without telephones and communication so i'd always ask myself how did someone sitting in delhi control afghanistan bengal maharashtra kashmir all these places and very good question there were scouts okay the scouts we used to come from each province every day the scouts will come and give the information to the emperor every That, day this is what's happening here this is what's happening there yes okay the but scouts. even the system in itself the mansabdar system which is landlords basically i don't know if you watch game of thrones Yes. Oh, of okay. course I was. So it's sort of like that. that yes. There's a king in the center yes, and then and everyone and else then, uh, yes. report the other yes. great houses report yes. to the king. Yes. Um and just like Game of Thrones, the real history is as brutal. It is even stranger than yeah. Game of Thrones. The guy who wrote Game of Thrones, George R R Martin, someone asked him that how dare you write such horrible stories which are so Not gruesome? In history. Yeah and his response is oh you think this is gruesome go read real history real, exactly. and you know people associate dark real history with europe but some darker shit has happened in india of course of course darker shit has happened in india i agree with you okay so the thing is um, now you know the scenario you know the, and what happened in the deccan the kings were little more they were shia kingdoms but some do not agree so the north mughals were the sunni and the, the south were the shia kingdoms adil shahi and also qutub shahi they had descended from afghanistan or i don't know where exactly but they were not the part of india so they uh, so what happened then they were little liberal 
and they allowed jagirdars now the mansab we are talking about the mansabdars of the deccan mm. jagirdars were more relaxed once the land was given then jagirdars children could actually it is not inheritable but they could inherit in mm. the south mm. so they were like kind of more relaxed mm. the jagirdars here they became rich mm. they started building forts fortresses they had their own sentinels their own army uh, of course they kept the cavalry for the shahats mm. so and in nizam shahi before it was destroyed by the forces of the mughal and adil shahi together it's a full politics nizam shahi was annexed went into two parts some part went to the mughal and some part went to adil shahi mm. it was annexed it was defeated two. No, they were defeated. Uh, Shivraj's father, Shahaji Raje, fought for. He he was fighting for the Nizam, okay, but he surrendered to Adil Shahi, and he was posted to Bangalore because he had a large Maratha following. When I say Maratha, I am not talking about the caste. There was no caste as Maratha. Maratha means Marathi speaking. It can be Brahmin Maratha. it can be kunbi maratha the farmers or it can be balutedar maratha which are the skilled workers like carpenters or um, goldsmiths i'm talking about them yeah. okay maratha means marathi speaking why did you say that like in the modern day it has a caste yes, oriented implication yes it has a caste intonation but those days no caste as maratha caste existed in okay. chhatrapati shivaji's times okay i'm very clear about that when i talk about maratha henceforth it is the marathi speaking sure like i am a maratha don't ask me my caste because i am simply marathi speaking though i don't believe in caste and religion i think what we refer to as maharashtrian in the modern day that's exactly. what you are trying to say exactly i am talking about maratha maratha is maharashtrians okay so he had a large maratha following so they didn't want to kill him outright so he was posted to bangalore away from the mountains now you will realize what what i talked in the first episode is that most of this kingdom uh, emperors empires and the sultanates depend on heavy duty cavalry okay all their mansabdars and jagirdars maintained cavalry forces and where this cavalry was uh, as uh, weak as a ship stuck in sand where will it be can you logically tell me now i am asking you question where this cavalry will be rendered useless is in the mountains how do you go heavy duty cavalry cannot enter mountainous region it is like a huge ship stuck in sand or ice mm. so this region the 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 nizam has given some kind of uh, uh, land to shahaji raje 100 villages 1000 villages i'm sorry 1000 villages were given around pune he was also given uh, shivneri the fort near nasik area but that portion went to the mughal so they had to leave where shivrai was born in shivneri his name comes from that fort it is near nasik mm. a nasik region so when they came to pune the entire region was devastated thousand villages were devastated in his jagir because the deccan sultanates allowed the jagirdars children also to carry on with the title so shivrai came he was hardly may, uh, maybe 7 8 years old when he came to pune it was devastated by mughal and um, and uh, adil shahi forces temples were gone i mean they were all in dilapidated state and uh, the, the the marathas from the adil shahi the marathas from adil shahi they had um, uh, tilled the land with uh, donkeys and there was a superstition if you till the land with donkeys and if you grow there something you try and grow uh, food there uh, your family will go so the entire region was like uh, grown with babul trees i am also a farmer okay so i tell you how difficult it is to remove babul trees from a khet from a farm 
if while removing one or two um, seeds go into the soil again the babul trees will grow what is a babul tree babul tree is the spike uh, they have spikes you know the okay. thorns okay thorny trees hmm. so the entire region was covered with babul trees it was basically not good for farming it was cursed land inauspicious mm. Mm. in simple words okay so when uh, what happened i feel my instinct when shahaji raje went to bangalore he kept jiza jizao mata and uh, his son shivrai he took his older son there shivrai's older sister older brother sambhaji his name is also sambhaji he took him there to bangalore with him but he kept his wife Uh, Jizau and Shivrai, and ask them to look after uh, the region, because if he leaves, see, suppose you leave this house unattended, encroachment may be there. Mm. Yeah, same way, that was his estate. No, he wanted somebody able, and he knew his wife is very able to supervise the region. A uh, couple of questions here. Yeah. Uh, in the last episode, we spoke about Aurangzeb. Yeah. Now, what part of Aurangzeb's timeline is going on at this time? He's become emperor. No, he's still a prince in Aurang Aurangabad, fighting it out he's with his brothers. He's a subedar. Yeah, this is a very good question. You know why? I'll tell you. He is still a prince. He is still a prince. He's nowhere near the th uh, uh, Mughal throne. Okay. Throne. Okay. Peacock throne, to be precise. Hmm. So he is fighting his own battles. In uh, he was sent to Kabul. and he is now once he was in deccan then he was again sent to kabul and again he came back to deccan all this when this was happening the mughal forces that uh, shah ji had to deal with were uh, shah jahan's forces shah jahan's forces okay shah ji raje dealt with shah jahan's forces. and why do you say that and there was a, another soldier uh, with along with whom he fought is malik ambar malik ambar is a, a fantastic character in this entire history Malik Ambar was working for Nizam Shahi. Okay. And he fought along with Shahaji Raje to protect Nizam Shahi. Hmm. Before it was annexed by the Mughal and the Adil Shahi forces. Okay. Malik Ambar was a slave boy from African continent. Oh really? He was bought by somebody and bought to Amman Nagar and he was that um, um, Ambar uh, a sardar called Ambar he was trained in military tactics and made a sardar. he was even sold he was taken to afghanistan and sold there in kabul i think when you say made a sardar you mean made a general a uh, general war general mm. when i say sardar is a war general then mm. he was brought back to ahmednagar where i was born that's why i'm connected with history i feel and is he, there like you said african continent is there any slave trade yeah but which country could it possibly be i think be? it is ethiopia i'm not sure he was a ethiopian slave wow so there is some uh, uh, black he, history here as well yeah so he was such an excellent warrior and he now marathas will jump at me but i feel his gorilla tactics there is no gorilla warfare gorilla tactics it was so excellent i feel instinct that shahaji raje might have learned that tactic from him and he must have learned certain things from shahaji raje got it and he was so devoted to nizam after his death the whole nizam shahi collapsed uh, nizam's son became a traitor uh, malik ambar's son became a traitor really uh, so there is a big history in that was there a lot of uh, african influence on india in this period no not malik ambar i'm talking okay. about just and somebody even asked me why don't you write a book on malik ambar but it's a very big history and you know writing a book is not easy you have to go into complete research into that you mm. have to do a lot of research mm. but he was an interesting like mir jumla i'll tell you later this was an interesting character okay he is also in my books he is there in history okay so this was going on and then shahaji raje had to surrender he was transferred to bangalore and uh, shivrai came with his mother to pune so there are two things you must remember see there are two types of subedars one is mughal subedar he is given a province and you know most of the mughal princes were subedar subedar means you look after a province similarly in in the deccan also there was subedar look after this province and you are a subedar you are in charge of the jagirdars so being this mountainous region and not yielding much of uh food 
the there was no adil shah he did not appoint any subedar when shivrai was growing up in pune mm. so he had nobody to report to in the sense there was no subedar okay which which probably meant that that relaxed mentality that adil shah and nizam shah uh, rulers had worked against them a little bit exactly so mm. there was no subedar even shivrai's father was 1000 kilometers away Hmm. Uh, 809 uh, to bang in bangalore and those days now you can fly within an hour those days it was far away hmm. it was like uh, staying in mars hmm. this those is days. this is the point in the podcast where i have to quote to my idol joe rogan hard times build hard men hard men build soft times soft times build soft men and soft men build hard times exactly this happened i mean it probably yes. this was a soft time for the uh, nizam shah and adil shah and even the mughal yeah. so i'm talking about the flaws what shivrai saw yeah. so when he was growing up his he had no subedar to report to he had no father figure they were uh, advisors like that dada ji kondev they were advisors like uh, you know his uh, say, who became his uh, sar naubat mm. uh, they were advisors and uh, there was uh, this um, uh, brahmin advisor who became the chief pradhan uh, that uh, the chief minister all these were his advisors i will get the names as i go along yeah. moropant pingle so but he, he was the jagirdar son so they bowed down to him and he, the freedom he tasted by instinct he what he, he there's no subedar and there's no father figure so he tasted the complete freedom there you know in one of my books shiv uh, shivrai's wife putala rani asked him what is what freedom means to you and i was like when i was writing this book sometimes i was possessed with shivrai and sometimes i was possessed with aurangzeb so i thought like unintentionally i started thinking like them you know i became crazy and mad i'm telling you this frankly no i love it Go so on. when the wife asked him what does freedom mean to you shivrai she asked her husband so he tells her in simple words freedom means to me that i must do what i want to do and i must refuse what i do not want to do which was not the case in his growing up years which was not the case with most of the maratha clan he knew who okay. were working for adil shahi and kutub shahi and in uh, for the mughals marathas are generally a warrior culture and and history not necessary you don't I'm look at it that way no maratha is marathi speaking so those families some families claim that they are from the rajput origin which i do i have not found the concrete evidence in history but there were some families who had capability of becoming warriors and they were taken in as warriors into the uh, um, uh, sultanates or in uh, into the mughal empire and they were given land but i'm i'm also talking specifically about the mentality of the marathas back then and again my reference unfortunately is some bollywood movies like when we when we see bajirao being depicted it's depicted like a warrior culture which is the legacy of shivrai but i'm asking you before shivrai's ascent to power was they, they simply worked for the sultanates there wasn't a warrior mentality there was oh, they they were the warriors of the sultanates they okay. fought for the sultanate okay okay some hmm. families not some, all many of them were cultivators now how can all the families be warriors they were cultivators they were priests uh, then they were um, uh, technical uh, the, the, the skilled labor like D- did that change after shivaji maharaj's ascent now you are talking about shivrai's history so what he started doing he started uh, you know he started thinking when he, he was growing up he saw dilapidated uh, forts hmm. so he knew that one fort he learned that if you are 10 people on the fort you can fight 1000 people who are at the foothills mm. because you are at the you can throw anything naftha balls yeah. and you can even simple rocks you can throw from height advantage height, yeah from the height and fight with them what i always tell i don't know there are certain things which i go along which nobody ever thought even not even the hindu kings kings for 2000 years so i feel shivra had the iq of 
he could have e e made an equation like E is equal to mc square. That level of things he thought then, you know, scientific things. So I sometimes equate him with Einstein. So how he thought that? How nobody else thought? No other Hindu king, not even Vijayanagara Empire Hindu kings thought that. Why? So first thought was, I must, these are, these are simple things. How he, when he grows up, what he thinks was his vision. That's different. That is like E is equal to MC square. So he thought if I take this, those dilapidated forts, Adil Chai was relaxed. They had joined hand with the Mughal. So those forts around Pune were used as brothels. And they, the, the, the um, granaries were not looked after. The walls were not repaired. Uh, the whole structure was falling. And uh, the people staying there were very casual. So they were not in fighting spirit. Nothing was maintained. You have to maintain a fort. How you maintain a fort? It has to be maintained strong. The outer wall has to be strong. And no enemy should penetrate inside that fort. The granaries must be full. So even 500 uh, sentinels or uh, warriors or foot, uh, foot soldiers come, they can stay there. The rain harvesting uh, has to be, the, the, the lakes have to be cleaned and maintained. So you have drinking water. So fort maintenance is not a joke and they mm. were not maintaining. So Shivra thought if I can just take over these forts and repair them and make them fighting fit, I will have a base here. And Jagirdars, what Jagirdars? Many Jagirdars uh, can have thoughts like me. So the Jagirdari system itself, there is a flaw. Why would a king outsource? See, that time the real power was with the Jagirdars. The Shahs and even to an extent the emperor were titular heads. What power they had if they are outsourcing the army? Are you trying to say that Aurangzeb possibly wasn't as powerful as we think no, he was. He, so th I'm saying, you no. Know, how Shivrai saw the flaws. So the optical illusion which the ah. Mughals created, that is why I said in the okay. first, the optical, everybody was scared of that optical illusion, that they are so powerful. It was like how in big companies to scale, you have something called company culture that makes everyone think in a certain way. So maybe the Mughal empire had a culture, oh, he's an emperor, you better respect him. No, they used to have parades. Hmm. They used to have parades in Delhi to show their and uh, through the roads of uh, Agra to show how powerful they are. Yeah. Yeah. They were, uh, you know, uh, there was a show of power, I Got would it. say. Hmm. But it was optical parades. illusion oriented power. Yes. And okay. they had Aga, Aga, uh, Agadis or they, they had their own cavalry force, the, um, the emperor hmm. himself. And they were only good for parade, those soldiers. They are not good for battlefield. Mm. Dress well, beautiful, go go on the cavalry, then will come the elephant cavalry, then will come the cavil, ca camel cavalry and it will run through Agra streets, Delhi streets. It's just a show. And the, um, our uh, kings and those, they became vassals. No, that optical illusion they created. Mm. So what Shivrai had at that time, thousand dilapidated villages, no collection, the land was not cultivate, uh, cultivated. So, when Dadaji Kondev, and now everybody gets angry when they talk about Dadaji Kondev, because there is a split between Brahmins and Marathas. You know, now they have created a caste called Maratha. Dadaji Kondev, what he did, he guided Shivrai. In, in, he was not his guru, I will not call guru. Shivrai had his own instincts. Nobody can be a guru for a person like Shivrai. But what he indicated that we can remove this curse by tilling the land with a golden uh, plow. Plow, they, what they call it. So they tilted, they made a small gold plow and they tilled, they, they tilled the land uh, by, uh, with Shivrai. Shivrai tilled the land and they said now the curse is gone. And they went from mountains to mountains, from forest to forest. And brought back the cultivators, which were hiding there. So then the cultivation started. Then when the cultivation started, then the uh, the the ta they started paying taxes. Some legitimate legitimate money started coming in Shivraj's 
ट्रेजरी जस्ट वॉन्ट टू हाईलाइट वन कॉन्सेप्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ जियो पॉलिटिक्स ऑल वॉर्स आर वन आर लॉस बेस्ड ऑन लॉजिस्टिक्स इकोनॉमिक्स इकोनॉमिक्स सो बिफोर यू एक्चुअली गो टू वॉर यू फिक्स योर लॉजिस्टिक्स सो वेन द मनी स्टार्टेड कमिंग इन स्किल्ड वर्कर्स लाइक बलूतेदार स्टार्टेड कमिंग इन देन द पूना बिकेम अ हब ऑफ एक्टिविटी so first you become rich before doing your mission yeah mission no then he sta- he started with 100 a training farmers what he said he 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 was very clear once the forts were acquired he needed to man them in in marathi it is called shibandi or fort cavalry a mm. fort not cavalry sorry fort soldier fort, fort not foot soldiers fort soldiers yeah so you go uh, he wanted to man the forts with soldiers so how so what he told the uh, the people many of them balutedars and kunbis and brahmins also you do your work for 6 months in rainy season you become my soldier mm. when you are not doing your work mm. so he started training them so this was a start and uh, he uh, shivra acquired few forts around how he acquired he just went there paid them some money because now the, the, he got some little money from the uh, from the cult, uh, agriculture tax you know because the land was getting tilled and uh, they were growing some grains so he got little money and he started training some people uh, marathas marathi speaking i mean uh, swords he got and uh, yeah he's a jagirdar son after all he knows the tactics he knew what his father was doing he had seen it while growing up so he started training the people and then manning the forts and repairing them people say that he found a gold pot of gold coins in one of the forts but you know those are uh, hypotheses uh, stories which i don't know i i i have no history to maybe it is true maybe it is not mm. so he manned the forts and there was one fort called purandar he meant that there was uh, there was the fort commander there he uh, took shivrai took him in confidence or and then he took over purandar also he took took over uh, kondana which was later known as singhagad then few other forts he took over around so then adil shah woke up what the hell is happening around th- that area then he uh, called uh, shahaji rajan and said what is your son doing how old was uh, shivraj at the time in his early teens Re- early teens yeah i think 15 16 not 18 also and he, he had figured out ec- economics and business exactly that is what i'm saying how i don't know how it the thoughts came he was in his teens only when this was all happening But, uh, then uh, shahaji raje sent the message to uh, dada ji kondev that see what shivraj is doing why is he doing these things Uh, shivrai did not listen to anybody then again uh, shahaji raje some say he was you know he already because he was doing so great he was taking he was fighting from bangalore for now adil shah and he was taking over temple towns of south from um, vijayanagara empire which was breaking down anyway so he had acquired certain kind of respect in the heart of adil shah so when he had acquired that respect he had organically created enemies in the darbar of adil shah and there were some marathas and some muslims were his enemies one of them was afzal khan so he was creating enemies so history said now i don't know whether it is correct history because i have read it in uh, bakhars which are you know you pay commissioned writing so i don't know really not in through correspondence so they say he was captured and taken to Vij- uh, bijapur and he was you know asked questions but the bottom line is that he said to adil shah my son is beyond my control do what you want to do with him because you think he secretly knew that the son will still rise to power anyway he had no idea at that time i feel how will have anybody can he uh, nobody can predict future okay so he said this that i cannot control my son he does not listen to me you do what you want with him 
Then that time Adil Shah sent the first force to when Shivrai was in Purandar fort, the whole Adil Shah force, maybe 1000 or 2000, 5000, I'm not sure, which is there in my book, cavalry force to Purandar. And for the first time in history, an independent Maratha Jagirdar son defeated the invaders. First, that Purandar at the foothills, Adil Shah, Adil Shah, Sardars were killed and then they went back to uh, Bijapur. Use the core logic of height advantage. This was the first ever Shivrai's victory, which gave him complete confidence. Mm. Okay. So, Purandar's first history was Purandar. After that, then things started rolling fast. Now, he wanted what he wanted to get the Marathas maximum amount of Marathas into his fold and fight against Adil Shah. Nobody joined him. Why? Other than one family, Jaydes. Of course, they were, they did not see success there. It's a death we, trap. It's a death. I mean, they were really reluctant to join. There was one such Maratha family called the Mores. They were in the valley of Zavli. See, if you see geographically, his, this is Pune. Shivrai then knew that going towards east, towards Bijapur is futile. Because he cannot, his force cannot fi fight pitched battles, face-to-face -face battles against a great cavalry force. Mm. Because he doesn't have strength, he doesn't have money. So where would he go? Where will he expand his territory? Is only western side. Konkan, which is still very, there are treacherous slopes if you see, the Sanyadri slopes. The entire region is mountainous. Konkan itself is not good for heavy duty cavalry. So how he thought about this, I don't know. So I give him full marks for that thinking. That he's, he knew very clearly that Konkan is my next um, uh, station mm. where I would acquire Konkan uh, and rule. I can expand my territory. He was also looking to expand the territory. More agriculture tax. So he, but to acquire Konkan, it was not like uh, national highway today. We go to Pune, Bombay easily. There were treacherous tracks. I got the map of those tracks also in my book. Of course, I have not made it. It is uh, adopted from another book. So, he needed the valley which, li which now lie between uh, the Pune region and Konkan. That mm. is valley of Jauli. Which is dense. Then it was where Pratapgat Fort is now there. If you had gone there. The valley of Jauli on the banks of Koina. Koina flows through that. The river Koina. That was too dense. And the mountains were more treacherous. They were like imposing. They were like falling on you as, as if, if you see those mountains. I have seen Alps, you know, they look manicured little things in front of, if you go to Sanyadri in this region, Jauli region. So, he want, the Mores were ruling Jauli. Now see, the, now you will have to think of history very hard. Like, I would say, please pay attention to this part of history. So, he wanted to attack the Mores. And now he was in his 20s. He wanted to take over the... First he wrote a lot of letters to Moritz. Please, join me. So Moritz said, nothing doing. Who are you? Moritz were also very arrogant. They were collecting, coming to Shivrai's territory and his Jagir and collecting taxes and, you know, they were torturing farmers. So Shivrai said, stop all this and join me against my fight against Adil Chahi. Then one lobby was formed, anti Bhosle lobby. Because here Shivra, they were jealous of Shahji Raja and Shivra was, you know, asking them to do things which were mm. unheard of. Uh, this is the first time the name Bhosle is coming up on this episode. So, yes. you'll have to give some context to the listeners. So, Bhosle, uh, Shivra's surname was Bhosle. Okay. So, that is a family. Okay. So, that lobby was getting formed, you know, and the, it was headed by Abdul Khan. It was all political, nothing to do with religion. Mm. It was all against, you know. It's all political for power. And money. And money. And of course the fame. Hmm. So, and Abzal Khan has his own deep insecurities because he was the son of a cook in the uh, Bijapur's uh, Darbar and he was always looked down upon by the rich 
Muslim and Hindu and uh, Afghan and all those Sardars. So he wanted to show, now I have arrived. So he was trying to, you know, for power he was fighting. for. Then uh, Mores refused to help. That same year, 1656, Shivrai attacked uh, the valley of Jauli. At the same time, Prince Aurangzeb was attacking Hyderabad to get military power in the south. Mm. That I told you, no? Yeah. So, 19, uh, 1656, in February, March, when Shivrai attacked uh, Valley of Jauli, uh, Aurangzeb attacked Hyderabad. On the last episode, we spoke about Mughal war tactics. I would like to know what a teenage Shivrai and a 20-something Shivrai did with his warfare tactics. Because they couldn't have been the same, different uh, number of soldiers, different terrain, etc. So what was the specialty of this force? Because I feel like maybe when the empire actually scaled, it was a more scaled up version of how they started in terms of warfare. So I keep hearing this term guerrilla warfare. When it comes to Maratha there is no, warriors. First of all, there is no such word as guerrilla warfare. It's wrong. What is the right thing is guerrilla tactics. Mm. Okay. What, tactic. what does guerrilla mean? There, it, the name has come from that uh, she, uh, Shev, that um, South African guy, you know, who fought. She Guerra. Yeah. South she Guerra. American. Yeah, 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 South African. South, South American. American. Yeah, hmm. yeah. It, that the word has come from there. Hmm. Uh, in Marathi, it is called Ganimi Kawa. Okay. Ganimi Kawa. So, when you... See, when your force is very small and you don't have enough force, actually, uh, then, then what you do, you try other tactics. Like, suppose the Mughal uh, cavalcade is going. You attack the vanguard or the back tail and loot. Mm. Or you show them, you uh, you wait in uh, ambush and uh, attract the, some of the um, uh, uh, Mughal forces or Sultanate forces and when they come to that spot, they have nowhere to go, attack them and kill them. Or suppose you are a uh, Mughal Sardar and uh, posted, uh, you are fighting near um, uh, Amannagar and you need large amount of food. And the, the food is coming from Aurangabad, the full food chain with, the, you know, uh, mules and you, uh, oxen you, mounted, grains and all that. You attack that chain and divert it to your region and mm -hmm. fully loot that. Mm. So you are not, you are deprived of food and even water. These are all the gorilla tactics. Mm. There are many, many gorilla tactics. For example, scorch earth policy. Scorch earth policy. I mean, suppose... Uh, you, you are uh, sitting in a town, a walled city, fort, and around the farmers and cultivators and the great, some other force is coming, outsiders, invaders. What you tell the cultivators, come inside the wall and uh, fill your wells and all the water bodies with mud. And you uh, bring, bring the grains inside the walled city and if you cannot, burn the grains. Means starve the, that is scorched earth policy. Burn the entire thing. And don't do, uh, uh, deprive the enemy forces of food and water. Mm. So that kind mm. of tactics. What about weaponry? Huh? Like what weapons were used? The same weapons, swords and javelins. Mm. But the but see, the farmers didn't use, no? They had to just cover the water bodies with mud. So these are all tactics. But Shivrai's people also used, but Shivrai's people were light cavalry. Unlike, unlike the uh, Mughals, no helmet, no chain, no uh, heavy duty shields. Uh, they some some of them will fight with two hands with the swords because mm. you know this double power doesn't matter if they are killed. The shield is not there. So it's relying more on agility and speed. Agility, speed, and uh, and uh, capacity to go into places like valleys and uh, river beds easily. Mm. So when he attacked Mores. He won that valley. He treacherously killed that man. What about Aurangzeb when he was attacking Hyderabad? 17,000 Hyderabadi soldiers were massacred. And Mir Jumla, who was the chief minister of Hyderabad, joined Aurangzeb in that battle. So then 
when uh, nobody talks about Aurangzeb attacking Hyderabad, nobody blames him. When Mughal do it, it's wars of expansion. Mm. When Shivrai does it, it's treachery. How? I don't understand. Mm. So I strongly defend Shivrai in that. Okay. Not for anything else, but for the truth's reason. You mm. see? No, how, truth. how did he beat uh, the Adil Shah Empire finally? Just like this, through slice, no, slicing Adil out Shai pieces? No, Adil Shah Empire killed itself because it's the, the Adil Shah has died very fast, you know. Ibrahim Adil Shah, then Ali Adil Shah. They, Adi Adil Shah, Ibrahim Adil Shah did not have children. Okay. Huh. He adopted Ali. Hmm. Okay. It became Ali Adil Shah. So, and he had a mother called Badi Sahiba, Ibrahim's, Ibrahim Adil Shah's wife. So, this Badi Sahiba and Adil, Ali Adil Shah were mother and son, very lovable, you know, they were two together, very sweet relationship mm. they had, mother and, though he was adopted. Yeah. What did Aurangzeb do when he was a prince in Aurangabad? He started writing nasty letters to Badi Sahiba. What he said, adopt, adopting a child is against Islam. And you have adopted a bastard whose child we do not know. So he is not the legitimate king. So you give me back your kingdom or I'll attack and kill you. He started bothering her. But this Ali Adil Shah also died quickly. And then his four-year-old boy, Sikandar, came on the throne. And then there was a big politics. So they he, he was just a de facto, he's just a puppet, that small boy. And the Pathan, uh, Pathans, Pashtuns, and uh, Dakkani Muslims, and the Marathas, and uh, all these started fighting for power. And the African Abyssinians. They, what they is said, Abyssinia? Abyssinia is the old name of, of Africa. Okay. The, so the people who hailed from there, including Siddhis, are known as Abyssinians. This must have been like Somalia, Ethiopia. Yeah, so that, that this, this side of, uh, mm. eastern, eastern part of Africa. Mm. Because easier to come, no? So they, these Sardars started fighting for power. And in that fight, Adil Shah is, you know, so it is like hard and soft and hard and soft. Mm. And when Shivrai was there, actually, the Mughal uh, Empire also has become a soft uh, force. Mm. Because their Mansabdars became so lazy that in one of the fights, one of the Mansabdars uh, disappeared in rainy season with 400 dancing girls in the mountains of Denkan. And their mansabdars became so lazy that they would sleep on the bed in the night and then four people will take them from, they, if they wanted to change from one camp to other camp, he will be sleeping in that luxurious bed and four people will carry him. Mm. And then they had their concubines and their artisans and their dancers and their other women, everything in the camp. Mm. So they also became kind of a soft force, you know. Mm. But how Shivrai defeated is actually what blew Adil Shah apart is that the invasion of uh, the the Adil Shah, I mean Abzal Khan's uh, attack on uh, Shivrai. So that was the turning point against Adil Shah. But that's a long story. In short, what happened? So when uh, Abzal Khan came to, you know, he wanted to, uh, he get, they he got 10,000 cavalry force from, and uh, some other 20,000 joined him as foot soldiers. They, they came from Bijapur towards Pune. Then, uh, by then, Moret's Jauli Valley had been acquired. Pratapgad was built with because Moropan Pingle was also an architect. He helped uh, Shivrai to build Pratapgad into uh, in on the periphery of the Jauli Valley. Konkan was near to him now. Konkan was in his grasp because Jauli Valley Valley was with Shivrai now. His force was increasing. And Abdul Khan was double whammy for Abdul Khan. He hated Shiva, Shahaji Raje. He also hated uh, Shivrai for taking of taking uh, value of Jauli because it was he was erstwhile Subedar of Wai, where Jauli Wali fell into that territory. What was happening to Shahaji Raje at this time? He was just he left. was there in okay. Bangalore. He was he still was, uh, yeah, conquering yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, he was okay. conquering, fighting for Adil Shah. Okay. 
So all this was happening when Abdul Khan came. What did Shivrai do? His uh, wife Sai Bai was very ill that time. So he took, he said bye bye to her, you know. And of course, I have made it little uh, juicy in my like little emotional hmm. to add on. So he goes to he ha- goes and hides in Pratapgarh, and he uh, he wants Abdul Khan to come to the because you can see Koyna River from the Pratapgarh fort, you know, like a small river. It's a big river, but you can see a small stream from that height. So he wanted Abdul Khan. Abdul Khan has packed into Wai with all these forces. So he wants him to come to um, uh, the Valley of Jowli and meet. It's all a trap, no. Once he comes to Valley of Jowli, his forces are useless. Mm. The ship struck in sta- sand. So with lot of diplomacy, which goes on to and forth, and and then the discussions and the meetings, Abdul Khan lands half with half his military on the banks of Koyna River. And then when they meet at the uh, Shamiana, which is made majestically beautiful by. Shivrai to honor Abdul Khan, he kills Abdul Khan there. But Abdul Khan tries to hold him and kill him in his grip because he has killed one Hindu king before in the meeting. And then uh, the the story is famous. Shivrai yeah. kills him with his uh, bear claws, tiger, tiger claws, claws, tiger sorry. claws. Um, yeah, th- this is the story that I think is one of the most mainstream stories about Shivrai. One of the, but this is not his vision. What I mean, he, what happens? You know, we get lost in these stories, and we don't know his vision. Okay. What was his vision? Um, this incident had actually happened, though. This has happened. Uh, where there was a weapon called a tiger claw, which you yes, can yes. hide. It's a stealth yes, weapon. Yes. So when Abdul Khan goes to hug him and crush him through yeah, his yeah. hug, uh. Shivrai pulls out his intestines. That's yes, what I have yes, yes, understood about it. Yes. Okay. Have you ever Enough. seen a version of that weapon? Yes. Do you think that it looks like it could kill? Yes. Because when I had seen a version of it in, I think the Mumbai Museum, I couldn't understand how it could kill another human being. Uh, Maybe yeah. cause a lot of damage for sure. Yeah, but... damage, damage. Hmm. Actually, he was beheaded afterwards. But first damage was done here, just to loosen his grip. Hmm. But the thing is, you know, instead of going into these short stories, I would love to talk about his vision. Sure. Do you think it it was the same vision at the start, or did this vision develop? I'm, His I'm, vision developed. This is the Swaraj vision. The Swaraj vision developed. No, Swaraj he wanted independence because he knew under the invaders' rule, uh, the he he and everybody else, the common man, are the secondary citizens. You know. Okay. So. The vision was different. So now you know how the army was developed for the empire and the sultanates and even the Vijayanagar Empire, including our old Hindu empires, famous empires, two thousand years ago. Hmm. They had either Mansabdars or Jagirdars or Vijayanagar Empire had Nayaks, and even uh, ancient kings had uh, Jagirdars. Even the the British system was like that. Yeah. The land they trust the king will give the land to the trust trustworthy zamindars. zamindars, you know, mm. landlords. What Shivrai thought? What was his vision? So his vision was: I will not outsource the army. I will have my own army. In terms of earlier, the jagadars or zamindars had their own micro armies which would come together to fight yes. wars. Yes. Now you. Imagine there were ten Mansabdars, all powerful, huh? and you are the Mughal emp- emperor. Hmm. You want to call those ten Mansabdars? Their armies are trained in different way, and they all have uh, sky size, king size egos. Mansabdars, no, they will not get along with each other, will they? Two Jagirdars, very rare. They will have rivalry. They will have jealousy. Who is having more favor from the king? Hmm. Who is f- king's favorite? Mm. So Shivrai thought this system has a flaw. This will not do because Jagirdars can get powerful. I have become powerful. I have acquired the forts. So tomorrow any other Jagirdar will Jagirdar will come and acquire my forts which I have acquired. So I want to demolish Jagirdari system. Now how you demolish Jagirdari system by creating an army. Paid from your own treasury, 
then you are not asking the mansabdar which is easiest way take the land take the uh, agricultural tax and uh, maintain cavalry no i will co collect the agricultural tax my men will collect the agricultural tax it will go to my treasury and i will appoint the soldiers and i will pay the soldier from my treasury and the soldier will report to the king so centralized system versus decentralized systems also beyond that now what we have what we have we have general then we have lieutenant general then we have major general then we have brigadier then we have um, colonel mm. lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. colonel mm -hmm. so what does what does this mean this is chain of command you go to any army person whoever is working in the army and ask that person is it possible to fight a war a, without chain of command he will laugh he will say not possible what question you are asking what stupid question you are asking he will say he or she okay similarly shivrai created this system he created sarnavat the army commander then he had panch hazari then there were hazaris and then there were jumladars and then there were hawaldars and the entire system had support system of food carriers spies there were regiments and then there were um, squadrons these are all creative business ideas at play to create a very strong self sufficient system and chain of command hmm. this he is the first king in india who had envisioned this and created this you there are you, i do not know in indian history i have not seen this kind of chain of command there may be rudimentary chain of command somewhere else in roman empire they say there were legends and i do not know but i do not think shivrai would have read roman history mm. i don't know whether such kind of chain of command was there in roman mm. history also mm. so this is his vision vision number 1 that my army will be paid by from my treasury and it, there will be chain of command hmm. i do not know where he got the idea from and how it originated from his mind that is mystery of the history this was his vision chain of command and army will be under me no hmm. jagirdar jagirdar is his system hmm. mansabdar is system in not hmm. in my kingdom what else what else now how do you collect agriculture ta tax they were hereditary vatandars vatandars those are the bhumi putras i am from a vatandar family deshmukh and then there are patils deshmukh will look after the cluster of villages and patil will look af a after a village got gotcha. you so they will collect the shet sara culti they will encourage the cultivators they will provide certain tools and fertilizers they will control the cultivators and collect the taxes from them and they will keep some tax and rest they will hand over to the deshmukhs and deshmukhs will hand over to the jagirdars their portion mm. and jagirdars will keep the cavalry God. now vatandari system was a hereditary system if i am a vatandar my son will become a vatandar hmm so these vatandar also became very powerful they also built fortresses they had their own sentinels they had the um, uh, fights between among themselves very severe fights that one vatandar's wedding the other vatandar will come and massacre everybody this is there in history this maratha is history when shivrai was ascending no shivrai was when shivrai was born and growing up he seen this okay so what was his second vision i will demolish vatandari system mm. but when you are trying to demolish vatandari system like i am a deshmukh i am a medha deshmukh baskaran so somewhere i got the land sometimes so m m what will i think if i have the land and i am living like a king in my terrain why the hell i should give up my vatandari who will so what did she, what was shivrai's vision nothing hereditary everything on merit my people will come and collect the taxes and the taxes will go to my treasury and from where my soldier will be paid yeah this is vision number 
Nobody had that vision. Vatandari, Vatandars and uh, this Deshmukhs and parties, even Akbar and uh, Jahangir and Aurangzeb could not uh, dislodge them. They depended on them mm. when they came to South or anywhere else. Yeah. They depended on these people right. to collect the taxes. So he wanted to demolish this system. He, he actually received a lot of hatred and anger from the Vatandars. Mm. Now we say, you know, uh, Marathas were, I mean, I'm not again talking the Jat. Marathas went against him because he started to, de- the Vatandar Marathas, they yeah. did not like it. I mean, if anyone's rising to power, there is going to be not opposition. Not rising the power. He's taking power away from them. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he's rising on a national scale. National so. scale. No, that is another aspect. He is taking power from me. It's coming personal now for me. Sure. It became personal. So the ones who opposed were brought down by force? Yes. Okay. Brought down by force. Huh? Okay. Their vatans were demolished. He could not do entirely. He could not do away with vatandars entirely. Mm. Because the system was like deep rooted in the, in the soil of India, yeah. I would say. Yeah. What else in the vision? Third is vision is, third vision is, see, when... Uh, when it's a mansabdari system, the money paid to the soldiers is not on time. Because king is not the boss. The mansabdar is the boss. And everything depends on his whims and fancies. So money will not be paid to... The arrears would rise. So some soldiers were not paid five months, six months, eight months, one year. Vaisai kaam chal rahe. What would the soldiers do? The Mughal soldiers, troopers... They will go into the enemy territory, loot, take away women and child, children as slaves and sell them and make money. These, are, these were the perks of not getting salary. Instead of salary, these perks were given. What is the difference between Bacha, Aurangzeb and Shivrai? They both were not women. They never, you know, they treated women with great respect. Both. 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 Okay. They were... One was, of course, a fanatic. One was religious, but not fanatic. Most important difference is Aurangzeb allowed his soldiers to loot the other territory. Take what you want. But with Shivrai, first time in the history, he started military law. If you harass women and children, even in enemy territory, you will be executed. You will be thrown from the Takmak Tok of Raigad. Um, food, hmm. which I find is a third vision. Okay, it's like nobody military law has now. We talk about military law. He thought of of, of it then, hmm. and he also punished many many people yeah. under that law. The fourth vision is now we talk about human trafficking, but slave trade was flourishing those days. Portuguese had become immensely rich, and Goa was known as Rome of the Orient. Itna rich they had become, you know. So, it's all on slave trade. But when uh, Shivrai, you know, he went to south later on, his south uh, victory or, or acquisitions, he acquired many 50 forts, including Fort of Jinji. Okay, that is another story actually. That belonged to Adil Shahi. He joined hand with Kutub Shah and acquired this land because it was neglected. And he wanted to create second line of defense against the Mughal. So when he took uh, Jinji, he also got the east coast of Chola Mandala. He acquired that. So he caught, ca- called the Dutch um, uh, traders. And he there, this is in history. Okay, We have correspondence on this. He told them, he said to them that if you do not stop the trade of gulam, I mean slaves, if you do not stop your slave trade, you will be eliminated. I do not want human trafficking in my area. Um, these slaves that we're talking about, these were Indian people. Being- Indian people, African people, they were men, women. And there were eunuchs, you know, uh, near Golconda, um, uh, near Golconda um, uh, fort in Hyderabad, evidence is there, historical evidence. They were selling 20,000 eunuch boys a year to the empires and the sultanates to look after their um, uh, harems. Hmm. So 20,000, we are talking about 20,000 eunuchs. 
to create 20,000 eunuchs, you have to first capture uh, at least 100,000 boys mm. out of that because death rate is very high in that mm. crude operation, you mm. see. Um, were Indian slaves sold abroad? Uh, some were slaves. Of course, in Konkan, uh, what, did, what was the business of Siddhis? They will come to the mainland from Fort of Janjira, which was separated by water. They will come capture uh, women and children and send them to uh, Middle East countries. What do you think? That was slave trade was happening. Okay. And the eunuchs fetched a good price, 10 mm. times more than the ordinary slave. Because uh, to create a eunuch, nine other boys died, one survived. Mm. Got it. Do so, you, I mean, have any context on which countries the Indian slaves were sold in? No, they were mainly saved to the, say, uh, sold to the Mughal Empire. Their mansabdars, mantar. Okay. See, mansabdars also had harems, no? Within within the Indian subcontinent, from one place within to another. The, within, then they were also so sent to Muscat. Oman. Oman. Okay. You know that was uh, they were sent uh, eunuch slaves. Eunuch slaves were sent to Portuguese became immensely rich. Also, what they did, and also Shivra wanted to, why he wanted to acquire this. West and East Coast. Because Mughal cavalry, see, when you want to, when cavalry, cavalry force is the heart of your army, what you need majorly? Horses. Mm. So, the horses from Arabia came by road to the Mughals. But horses to uh, the southern sultanates came by sea trade. Mm. So, what Shivrai thought, another vision of his, if I take over the uh, coasts, and if I take, if I build a strong navy, I will stop the horse trade to the southern sultanates. And their cavalry will become anyway weak. Mm. They will not get horses. How will they get horses? Okay. So that was all calculated. See, this is, these are the four visions. One is to create an army, to create chain of command, to bring in army law, to de demolish Vatandari and uh, Vatandari system, and put people on merit to collect agriculture taxes. Mm. Uh, they demolish slave trade. Who had this vision at that time? I think this is a good point to segue into the Navy angle. Yes. I think as far as I understand, it was India's first out and out Navy. Uh, you can't, I'll tell you what Navy he wanted to. Another, there are two visions into that. See, first, before I go to the, uh, go into his vision of Navy, now they say there were ancient kings in India who had uh, who had beautiful uh, who had very strong navy like the Chola empire so we will see what what Shivra's vision was he did not want to fight battles on sea mm. number one because Portuguese were immensely strong they were the kings of the sea and just like Shivra in the beginning did not want to fight pitched battles on the plains with the heavy duty cavalry of the Mughal and the Sultanates Similarly, he did not want to fight sea battles with the Portuguese. What he wanted was, see, there are only three ways to make legitimate money for a kingdom. What are those three ways? One is agriculture tax. Here, yeah, loot, mar and vote are different. That's illegitimate money. Legitimate is agriculture tax. Secondly, road tax. So, there were 10,000, 15,000 oxen used to carry goods from this place to that place. So, when they cross through your territory, you... Um, uh, you have to pay taxes mm. at the nakas they call it you know so they pay third legitimate uh, way of ma many money making is uh, to take over merch to do merchant ships and send your goods your spices in konkan then your ore you know crude ore of uh, metal that was also there then uh, then explosives there there was a salt pitter salt pitter is a substance which is made in Konkan, which is put it in explosives, to create explosives. That, all that, plus, um, you know, some so many other things, mainly spices, you have to send it to other countries. So, w this trade was entirely driven by the Portuguese. Mm. And to an extent, Siddhis. So, what Portuguese did, that if you want to run a merchant ship, you have to take from, passport from us. And they had, for that, Catridge, it is called. That passport was called as Catridge. So, to pay for that cartridge was huge amount of money. Half the money will go into that cartridge paying to the Portuguese. 
and why Catrish paying that we will protect you and they were hand in glove with the Siddhis. Siddhis were pirates. They will attack the ships, the Portuguese will protect and then you have to pay huge amount of money. What country were the Siddhis from? They were from the Abyssinians. Oh, they were just from one this, of the Eastern one African these, yeah. countries. Okay. Yeah. Are they collectively called Siddhis? Like I'm assuming they were from different... Siddhi is a title actually, like Sir. Okay. In the, there is this thing. How we say na, Sir, hmm. Sir G, then how we like that. It's a title. So okay. they were called Siddhis. And they, they were all high end, you know. They they were all powerful uh, warlords, Abyssinians. No, so they were Sergi. Hmm. So, so the drama went on. The Siddhis were attacked the ship. Then the Portuguese will protect it, and then you have to pay a lot of money to the Portuguese. So, what Shivrai thought? Why can't I have my own merchant navy? Why can't my people have do this legitimate business? But to do this legitimate business, I will need a small warships also to protect the merchant ships. So that was the idea of his navy. It's not, not to fight major battles. Mm. So to acquire certain business, which was happening in his own country, and give, give it back to his people so he can collect taxes on it. Mm. And improve his, because economy is everything. No? Mm. In an, yep. If you want to even dream of a Swaraj, economy is the basic. Um, you know, we have had some legendary Indian Navy veterans on the show. And this is what they basically explained about modern day navies as well. That there aren't really sea battles no. in the modern day. But navies are used to protect merchant vessels. Correct. That's the main purpose of navies Correct. all over the world. Now, I got to know that at age 29 because I run a podcast for a living. My question is, uh -huh. how did Shivrai know it at possibly around the same age? Same age. Uh, same age. Was he having his own version of podcasts? Was there a version of no, advisors in his life? he had a brain of E is equal to MC square. But there's got to be some input of data. I have no input of data from where, because nobody ever thought about this before him, you know. Okay. Even I, 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 I mean, I would like to realistically, if we go, if we take a time machine and go back to that age, <laughs> I'm sure there were uh, travelers and learned people who would just drop these knowledge bombs in king's courts and maybe he picked up information. But they were least. travelers, they went to all the sultanates also, no? Maybe Why the sultanates were too arrogant to listen. He just kept his ears open and kept accumulating knowledge. Actually, he, he you know, other like Aurang, there was another difference between Aurangzeb and Shivrai that Aurangzeb never trusted his ministers. Mm. But Shivrai trusted his ministers. Teamwork. He, yeah, teamwork. Again, this is, you know, after getting to learn these aspects of Shivrai, one thing I've understood is there's a lot of business mentality here. The, he's a businessman, of course. He's first a businessman, yes, then a because, warrior. Because, because, because how he's first a businessman. I will tell you the story of salt. There is a place near uh, Goa where salt pans are very extremely good quality salt they produced. Okay, that some ter terrain was later on taken by Shivrai and he started his own salt making. But though that salt used to enter from Portuguese territory to the Swaraj territory as well as Adil Shahi. And they used to sell that very expensive. That salt was extremely expensive. So the poor people could not even dream of buying that salt. And these Portuguese became, that money was just coming, slave trade, horse trade, ye trade, or not horse trade, spice trade. They were becoming rich. So what did Shivrai do as a businessman? He sealed all the borders and put heavy duty tax on Portuguese salt. Pay us tax and enter. You pay us tax. And he started manufacturing his so own salt in the regions, territories he acquired around that area. He started making his own salt and selling it cheap. Now, mm. what do you call it? Business mind mm. or what do you call it? Yeah, It's called game theory. You know, like you basically make the same product, price it much lesser huh. to cut out your cut competition. And, and put heavy duty tax. Mm. So, this, is, this aspect is taught taught in uh, two MBA students, you know. We should also get back to the story. I think people uh, were left at that part of Afzal Khan and then we digressed and went into philosophy and theories and business, which is great. I love it. But the audience <laughs> wants the linear story of what happened. You know, I think you, you left off 
uh, at the Afzal Khan part, and you said that the Adil Shahi uh, regime collapsed. No, after so that. so what they did the first time in life after Afzal Khan and his army was demolished, first time in life uh, Shivra uh, and his uh, Sena. his army went to why massacred remaining part of the uh, abdul khan's um, army and they went and they invaded adil shahi and they took over uh, panala fort so first uh, and many other forts around that vishalgarh mm. panala which belong to adil shahi so first time ever in history a uh, native person you know a uh, 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 um, son of son of the soil took over adil shahi territory territory so effectively the, how much territory did he have in maharashtra effectively not much he had pune 1000 villages around it few of the forts and uh, valley of javli and some parts of konk and the rest of maharashtra was with no that was like for example vidarbha and that side aurangabad and that was with the mughal mm. and uh, from nasik from nasik onwards that was with the mughal and this side um, eastern side eastern maharashtra was with the adil shahi okay what happened next now what happened so when this uh, shivrai uh, when he uh, took over adil shahi uh, forts the news reached aurangzeb he was very upset so you know there are two things aurangzeb was very clear he believed in dar al Dar al Islam. Dar al Islam means the the kingdom of Islam. I am not talking about Muslims anything. Okay, it is his way of thinking. Our Rangzeebs. I have nothing to say. And the the belief in that Dar al Islam is the remaining territory which is not under a Muslim king is known as Dar al Harb. H A R B Harb. that means it's a that's not the territory it's a battle ground any territory which is not under islamic king is a battle ground then when he saw his you know he wanted the entire india as dar al islam full territory should, there is should not be dar al harb no uh, non believer should rule and shivaji was coming up so this hit him very hard avrangzeb then his people his previous people who were subedars of uh, deccan couldn't do much i told you know one of the subedars went with 400 women and hid they, they couldn't stand this maratha onslaught so he sent the first person he sent was uh, shaiste khan shaiste khan was his own mama His one is this where the mughals mughals uh, enter the story and, yes they okay hold on uh, and parallelly the adil shahi empire is still there is there the adil shahi's empire is still there okay. and they are like not very strong now abdul khan's death caught the attention of entire india including the british how did word spread back then uh, by correspondence okay Cool. by correspondence sort of. and then there are british um, uh, correspondence in that that they are also shocked how abdul khan died because mm-hmm. everybody was sure the of the british the british the british were there british correspond i there is a book on british correspondence 200 page okay and so they they, were, they, they started they, a trade in india by this point ha uh, they were they came, they were very apolitical you see very apolitical we are not in politics we are not here to play politics so that was a lie actually <laughs> you see We wow. are not here to play politics. Well, uh, Indian history. A political his- British. Yeah, Indian history can uh, you know give a tough competition to Game of Thrones. That's all I'll say. Of course, mm. actually, I on my uh, this thing Amazon, or it is good read. Somebody has said uh, reading Frontiers was like Game of Thrones. Yeah, watching. Yeah, just listening to these two episodes yeah. <laughs> is uh, has been a Game of Thronesy experience. <laughs> Ma'am, thank you for two fantastic but, yeah, episodes. Yeah, but ours is even better history than Game yeah, of Thrones yeah. because that is fiction. And you know, it's also hard. It's it's more emotional, more violent. Yeah, um, it's our history, yours and mine. And if you actually look at the three lakh years of the human story, five hundred years is not that long ago. No, three hundred years is not that long years. ago. No, uh, it these things just happened in the human story. Yes. So 
Game of Thrones is real. That's all I'll say. Yes. But this is the point where we move into part three, ma'am. Thank yes, you for two fantastic you. episodes. Thank you. Third so one's going to be the epic finale of okay. this story. Okay. Awesome. This was an extremely detailed part two of this special trilogy. I'd love to know what you guys are thinking about this trilogy at this point. Tell us in the comments below. Happy to cover more mega stories like this from India's recent past. Point me to a story, point me to a person. But first, I'll point you to episode number three. The last two episodes were much more detailed, quite long, quite inspirational, sometimes a little scary. The third one is going to be extremely pacey because the story after this point is so incredibly detailed, so layered that we can't cover it in just one episode. It's an epic episode. But it's going to just give you an overview of the final aspect of this story. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you share it with your friends. And if you enjoy the podcast, make sure you follow us on Spotify. Every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Meeta Bhaskar and ma'am and Ranveer Alabadia will be back for part three very, very soon. See you guys.